what, what closes out the year is the second advent. Amen? Because in our, our um, Apostles' Creed, we say that Christ has died, or in our uh, communion liturgy, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Christ will come again. We seem to forget that. We seem to go about our lives, and, and some churches go about the, just the whole business of, of Christianity and worship and, and not um, speak to the fact that Christ will come again. And that God has already put into motion how He's going to shut this thing down. He's already made the decision. He already knows how it's going to play out. He has guaranteed us that. That at some point this all shuts down and there will be a final reckoning. That's biblical. You can't get away from that. There will be a final reckoning. You and I will stand in judgment for the things we did and the things we failed to do. There are sins of omission. That's my prayer many times is, Lord, let me see the opportunities to spread the gospel that you put before me. Let me see your plan for my life as it pertains to the kingdom. Because Jesus says... The kingdom is near. Which means that we see glimpses of the kingdom all the time. We, we, we speak about the beauty of the sunsets and, and <clears throat> Jim posts so many of those beautiful photographs uh, <clears throat> of this beautiful area that we live in. But do you know that it's all contaminated with sin? As beautiful as it is, it's nothing in comparison to what God has in store for us once He shuts this down and makes everything right. How glorious that will be. It's going to be, after the second coming, it's going to be one big party. Amen? It's going to be a big party and you know how long it's going to last? Forever. Forever. But Jesus is quite clear that some people are going to get in and some people aren't. And he's quite clear that even though those that get in, get in, <clears throat> not everybody's going to be treated the same. Now that's harsh and you might have some people want to debate that theology on that with me. But next week's sermon is going to confirm what Jesus says when we look at the, the, the parable of the talents, the, the the workers with the talents. <clears throat> That's what I mean. You will stand in judgment. You are already bought and paid for by the blood and, and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God paid. It's a legal contract. God, God took care of your sin and He purchased you. Right? <clears throat> You're in. You're in. God's never going to retract that grace. No matter how bad you get, once saved, always saved is a a doctrine that many, many preach, and it's valid. God will never pull His grace and His mercy away from you. Once you make that commitment, it'll never happen. You might give it up, but God's promise is good for eternity. <clears throat> but what the Bible does tell us, what Jesus does tell us, is that there's going to be a reckoning of what you did after you were saved. The opportunities you missed, the, the sins that you still willingly participated in, you'll be held accountable. Sometimes we don't want to hear that message, but it's very clear. And, and Jesus, in the last part of His ministry, makes these things very clear. <clears throat> and Christ, in the next few Sundays, in the next scripture, the scriptures that we read, the things we read, He's telling the church, He's preparing the church for a time that, that I would call liminal time. Liminal time is a space when you're not here or you're not here, you're right in the middle. If two circles were joined and you're not in one circle or the other, but where they join and they overlap, that's liminal time. You're not in both, but you're not in one or the other, but you're kind of in both. 
It's like this. It's like crossing a threshold. I, there's a point at which I'm not on the pedestal or off the pedestal. Right? This is liminal space here. This is the first advent. This is the second advent when we step into that. Second advent's not here. Second coming is not here yet. <clears throat> we are in this midway point. And what we do in here is what we're going to be judged on. Amen? So it's liminal. You're in the threshold. You cross into that door. There's a threshold right there. At some point, you're kind of in both places. And when the second advent comes, we move into that other place. We go across the threshold and we move into it. <clears throat> now, the parousa is what Jesus is talking about. He's telling them, I'm coming back. The parousa is a Greek word for... Um, the arrival or being present. So when, when Jesus comes back in his present, that's, that's called the parousa. And he's telling people, when I come back, this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to tell you some parables about it, and hopefully you'll understand what, what, um, what I'm trying to tell you. But Advent, the second Advent, is a definitive thing. It's, a, um, it's like a, a line of demarcation. Once it starts... There's no stopping it. There's, there's, there's no stop, let me get things right, Lord, because you're in that point now. The liminal time is the time to take care of everything. It's the time to prepare yourselves in personal holiness. It's the time when you are to become sanctified or made perfect in God's love. Amen? That's, that's, that's what you were saved for. That's what... Prevenient, prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace is the work of the Holy Spirit to make you what God created you to be and for you to step into what God created you to be and do to help establish the kingdom here. <clears throat> but we will one day. Can we agree on that? At one point, this is all over. This is all over. And, and, and there is no other, there will be no other opportunity. Those that are lost are lost. And those that are saved are saved. But there's still a judgment. There's still a judgment. <clears throat> and today's scripture is the first of a few parables that we are going to look at in the next two to three weeks. And it comes from Matthew 25. First verse. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but, but please give honor to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. He's not mincing words, right? This is what it's going to be like. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. <clears throat> These were most likely torches. These were most likely torches, not the little, small little lamps or like a little genie lamp. These were probably torches. They took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now in the, <clears throat> the context of the bridegroom, how this would play out <clears throat> is the, the, the bridesmaids would, um, first off, marriage was a very big deal. It was a, a week-long celebration at least. And so the bridesmaids would would, would gather these lamps or torches and they would wait for the bridegroom to come out. But nobody knew when the bridegroom was going to come out. He might be negotiating a dowry with the, the bride's wife or, or husband or father, but, um, but he came out at his discretion at, at his time. And so they were being constant waiting, waiting for the bridegroom to come out. And then they would escort him and they would walk through the streets with their lamps uh, lit and, and they would go to the bride's house and, and there where the marriage would happen. But once the, once the party, the wedding party was in the space, the door shut. And it was a big party for like a week. But the doors would shut. And those that, that were clothed right and had done what was right, would be invited in, and, and some wouldn't. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. 
But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. That's liminal time. They are in liminal time right there. The bridegroom is not there, but he's fixing to be. They're waiting. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, to trim their lamps, they would have prepped them, put the oil on them, and get them ready to light. <clears throat> the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. It seems kind of harsh, but you have to understand. They know that if they, there's not enough oil for any lamp to make it to where the bridegroom needs to go. So it's better for at least five of them to have some oil than it is for, five, than for ten of them to run out of oil and be in the darkness. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Surely y'all are getting this. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, that pretty much preach itself right there. <clears throat> Some parables are kind of hard to figure out, but that's, that's not one of them. <clears throat> when I did this, when I was reading uh, commentary on this scripture, you would be surprised at how some people interpreted this um, and how they cast the, the, the bridesmaids that didn't share their oil um, as not letting those who are on the outskirts of society uh, participate. And I thought that was a strange interpretation of this because it's very, it's very definitive about um, who gets in, what's expected of us, um, and how we wait. So what does it mean to wait? What does it mean as a Christian to wait? And as a society, we don't wait very well. Amen? We don't, we, don't, we don't do that. You know, my phone is right here. If I, if I have to have it, then I, you know, it's right there. Because I just can't wait to hear from, you know, I can't wait till I get out of here or something to, to uh, find out what somebody said or who, uh, whatever. But we don't wait. We always stand in anticipation. So what does is, what is waiting look like? What, is it, what does it look like for somebody who is truly anticipating? And, and you know, all the bridesmaids are, are probably, um, let's, say they are, let's say they are faithful people. But they're just not waiting well. Right? They're waiting in a foolish manner. They're thinking about today without thinking about tomorrow. Right? That's what foolish people do. That's what, that's what the Bible says foolish people do. They only think about today and never worry about tomorrow. But the wise people live in today and they prepare for tomorrow. So what do you and I, say the church, what does it look like for us in this liminal time, in this waiting time? Because this is a, a I guess this is an oxymoronic statement. How do we patiently wait? How do we wait with excitement? What does that look like? And how, how do we actively wait? What do we do while we wait without just getting lethargic and churches become um, apostate? We forget. We forget that tomorrow could be the day. That's the message. So 
Tomorrow could be the day. Tonight could be the night. And what are you doing while you're waiting? Or are we just kind of getting along? Getting from one Sunday to the next? Thinking that we're resting on our once saved, always saved laurels. That we're not called to do greater things. We're not called to minister to those on the fringes of society. We're not called, and it's not urgent, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do we wait? How do you wait? What are you and I doing or not doing? Because there is an accounting. I believe that as we wait, there's a few things that we can do. <clears throat> we need to repent daily. We need to acknowledge to God that we have uh, failed to be an obedient church. We have failed to hear the cry of the needy. We have failed to take care of one another. We have failed to love one another. We fail to even love one another inside the church. Think about that. If you fail to love someone inside the church, at what level are you failing to love someone outside the church? Someone that does not look like you, someone that does not talk like you, and someone that may not believe like you. Love daily. Love your enemies. Love those you have disagreements with. Rectify those disagreements. I believe you'll be held accountable. This, I'm going I'm 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 to go there. When this day comes, and we're in agreement, it's coming. Amen? Raise your hand. If you're, if you're in agreement, it's coming. I've got some outstanding issues with some people. Am I the only one? I'm the only one. Don't let those. Don't let those carry into your judgment. Amen? If we agree tomorrow could be the day, tonight could be the night, and you have disagreements with people inside and outside the church, when is the time to take care of it? Immediately. Immediately. Witness daily. Share your faith. Share your testimony. I talk personally with, with most of you and, and you, have a, you have a great love and a great passion for God. But I hope I'm not the only one hearing it. Right? I hope I'm not the only one here. I hope you're bold enough and you love Jesus enough to tell somebody about it. I remember when I got engaged to Kay, I, could, I just couldn't wait to tell my mom and, and everybody that would listen because a lot, a lot of people didn't think I'd ever get married. They never, they never think I'd find somebody to take me like I was. <clears throat> I was proud. Told everybody. But I have a Savior that took me too. And he loves me. And he died for me. And I should be able to express that and I should tell people about that love that not only I have for him, but that he has for me and for them. Read God's Word. You want to be wise? Read the Proverbs. Proverbs go a long way. Proverbs go a long way. You want to be wise. You don't want to be foolish. Seek things that are spiritual and everlasting. The treasures that do not rot are spiritual treasures. It's not works-based. 
Faith is not works based. Christianity is not works based. But it's good to do the works. It's good to do the works. It's good to carry those into judgment. Do not put your trust in things that are temporal. All this is temporal. This building, y'all learned that a decade ago when this, when this building burned down. It was all temporal. I bet, you lost, I bet you learned a big lesson then. You learned what the church really was. Your job, your boss, that money you think that you have to have, it can be gone in a minute. And no matter how much money you have, you cannot cheat death with it. Either I will die before it happens or I will live to see the end. Either way, I'm not in control of it. All I can do is be prepared and live my life like today is the last day. Get right with people, get right with my neighbors, and get right with my God. And make sure that God and Jesus Christ have the proper place in my life. No one has ever died for you except for Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> we have a week or two more of uh, what it's like or what Jesus, a few more parables of what uh, Jesus is telling us. Jesus is very adamant about preparing the church for what's coming. Um, next week may be a, 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 a good uh, a good a good Sunday to be here. It might uh, it's the it's the scripture on the talents, the three people. It might be a good sermon. You might leave convicted. I hope you leave convicted. I don't ever want anyone. I'm afraid. I don't want God to say when I stand in judgment, Gary, you failed to tell him. You failed to tell him that they needed to be prepared. This is that warning. The next couple of weeks will be that warning. And then we're going to turn and we're going to pivot on a dime and we're going to anticipate the birth of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen? What a way to pivot. What a way to go out. What a way to start. Let me pray for us. Gracious Lord and Holy Father, <clears throat> I hope that we hear what you want us to hear in these scriptures. I hope that we are convicted. And I hope, Lord, that we have a sense of urgency to make things right and to not carry things into judgment that we will be ashamed of. Because I think, Lord, sometimes that what we think is so important may seem petty to you and that we will be judged harshly for it. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you reveal those things to us And that your Holy Spirit dwelling in us will give us the ability to make the changes and to right the relationships that we need to repair, repent, apologize for, accept apologies for, Extend apologies. Let us humble ourselves because we will one day be humbled in your presence. Be with us as we leave this place. Keep us healthy. And let us have hope. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>